All right, this is Penny and uh, 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 Hank, or no, it's not Hank. Is it? Uh, Kevin. Kevin, I knew it was a regular name. <laughs> and then Mickey, uh, who are the corgis there on the floor. Now, uh, Kevin and Mickey are basically puppies. Kevin is an older puppy, um, and he's really primarily uh, the problem dog. My con biggest concern, though, was looking at her. She really is self-ostracizing uh, herself, moving out to the, uh, and you can see she doesn't have a problem with this guy. It's Kevin, uh, who she's has a problem with. Uh, now, she's practicing a little boy, she probably would prefer not to have this, but she's understanding he's a puppy, she'll deal with it. Um, but really, what I think we have going on here is we have a situation where the dogs had, we have three herding breeds of dog. They had no rules, they were under-exercised, they gotta tell the humans when to pet them. And I think that they thought of the humans, at least Kevin thinks the humans, are kind of gullible and he needs to look out for them and protect them. And he's decided his job is to be in charge of security. He also thinks he needs to correct these dogs. And all of the uh, incidents where he's nipped or bit have been when he's overexcited. So a lot of what we went over in this session was to how we can recreate scenarios and help Kevin practice them in uh, a calm and balanced frame of mind by breaking them down into individual steps, practicing each step one by one in slow motion until the Kevin handles that step properly, and moving on the next step. And then when we get all the steps down together like we did for the door, then we can recreate them and, and start moving them together a little bit faster, a little bit faster until we have a real world situation. Now, uh, basically we're gonna attack these problems in multiple fronts. One of the first things I suggested was the guardians incorporate some rules and structure. Um, rules and, uh, to the effect of not being allowed on the furniture. Now usually I say all the dogs should have the same rules, but because uh, Penny here is a sensitive dog and has kind of gotten the brunt end of things. I would suggest that she is allowed on the furniture and the other dogs are not. The other dogs are puppies. So it's kind of good for, she's the older dog, so it's good for her uh, to kind of be in that top position. It's going to help with her confidence. And if she's up here and they're down there, they can see her literally in a higher distinctive position. Um, let me see. Um, other rules. Uh, not being allowed uh, uh, to go out a door before the human having to sit at the door. If we tell them to sit and they, she, they don't sit, we walk away. We sit, sit once. If they don't sit within two or three seconds, we walk away, wait one minute, come back and again tell them, sit. And if one of them sits, we open the door, let that dog out, the other two dogs do not go out. And we walk away this time for two minutes, next time for four minutes, then for eight minutes. So each time the dog does not comply, it has to wait twice as long before it has another opportunity to do it the human's way. And this way the human is controlling the resource and if, if we're not uh, threatening the dog, we're not punishing the dog, we're, the reward for the dog is when you do what the human asks you to do, you get the reward, you get to go outside. Start off with uh, going outside and then do it inside and outside. Um, let me see, other rules, uh, can't go uh, up and down the stairs ahead of a human, can't be within seven feet of a human's eating, and the dogs are gonna eat in a structured way which we just got done doing. Now I also went over uh, the ways to do uh, directional commands. So what I want the guardian to do is give each one of the kids five of the tricky trainer treats that I'm gonna leave here, tear them in half, and go to different rooms in the house with one dog at a time. Touch the treat to the dog's nose, toss it out of the room, just so it's about three or four feet out of the room, not too far away. When the dog walks over and licks it up off the ground, we say the word out. So we're gonna create a vocabulary for all the dogs that when I ask you to leave, it's not that I'm mad at you, it just means I want some space, and there's a reward for doing so. Make sure, like I said, you do it in different parts of the house and do it with the dogs separately, especially not with Kevin around because I think that would cause a, a fight. We've seen a couple of little dust-ups and minor deals, but if there are fights, remember, go and grab Kevin by his back legs and pull him away. Um, let me see, um, other rules uh, or uh, other ways of adding structure. So uh, the guardians were basically petting the dogs anytime the dogs jump up on them or nudge them for attention, but I saw Penny a couple times, I saw all three dogs walk up to the humans and sit in front of them and the humans didn't recognize the sitting. Sitting is a desirable position. So um, just like if our kid uh, cl clears the table without being asked to do so, we make a big deal out of it. We make sure we let them know we appreciate that so they do it some more. Dogs are squeaky wheelers. They'll do what gets them the attention. So what I'd like to do is from now on, like right now he's nudging, he's trying to take something. So if I tell him to sit, right now I can't really because he's kind of sitting on in her face. Um, but in this case, if he's being a nuisance and I had invited him on the lap, like I say, he shouldn't be able to jump up on you without permission. So he can be up here as long as he behaves, but if he tries doing that again, I'm gonna make him get off the couch. Now again, to get off the couch, we can do the same thing. We can toss a treat off the couch. As soon as he gets it, we say the word off. So we have a vocabulary for off the couch and out of the room. We can do this for other things as well, to go outside, toss a treat outside, and say yard. Uh, he doesn't always like to come inside when we're calling him from outside. 
So go to the door and, and touch his nose with the treat and then toss it inside. Again, not when Kevin's around. And then when he comes in and licks it up off the, off the floor, you say inside or house or whatever you want to say. Come up with fun word command, uh, fun commands whenever you can. Um, I'd like the guardians to come up with a list of the command words and make sure that we're using the watchword we said vocabulary. So somebody in the house is saying, come here, and we say vocabulary to the person, they say, ah, come. We're going to use one word commands from now on to make it easier for the dogs to understand what's going on. We're also going to start saying paycheck. If we come into a room and we see that somebody's petting, the dog is standing up, we're going to say paycheck. That person stops petting, says sit. The dog sits, we're going to pet under the chin whenever possible and say just the word sit. And we tell the person, I asked the dog to sit before he came in the room, and he stood up when he heard you coming, and I kept on pitting, and David said, that's okay, which it is. Um, so the dog either has to do something to change its state and earn the attention uh, by changing its state. So if it's sitting, have it come and sit over here. Have it sit, have it lay down. Or it can come and prepay for attention. Come and sit in front of you. And when it does that, we want to make sure that we do recognize that and pet the dog and say the word sit as well. Uh, now that leads me to what I call passive training, which is the easiest way to train your dog. So every time the dog comes to you, pet it and say come. Every time the dog sits down next to you, pet it and say sit. Every time it lays down, pet it and say crash, or whatever your word is for crash. Anything your dog does on a repeatable basis that you want to create a command word for, just say the command for it. And eventually you'll be able to say beach and the dog goes to the dog bed. Or you say yard and the dog goes outside. Uh, giving a dog vocabulary makes it easier for them to do the things that we want them to do. Most dogs want to please us. We just do a horrible job of communicating what it is they could do to please us. Yes, Penny, I know. He's kind of in your way, isn't he? Let's move him over here a little bit. <laughs> there we go, buddy. You can be in the shot, but you just can't be in Penny's face. Um, okay, so uh, petting with a purpose and passive training, we'll move those over there. Um, we'll give you as many as you want because you didn't want any of them. Um, but basically, uh, the more that we pet with a purpose and, and reward desired behaviors through passive training, the more the dogs are going to emulate those behaviors. And now we're rewarding positive dog interactions as opposed to correcting the dog for the wrong thing. Remember, good attention from you and a bad attention from you is about the same thing to a dog. So if those things are equal and you start putting your emphasis on rewarding the things you want, those are the behaviors the dogs are going to start demonstrating. Um, what did I say to remember? The leash, okay, so the leash thing, uh, if I forget to put this in the write-up, if it's not linked, make sure you message me and I can add it to the link above, and hopefully when you're watching it, you'll see it there. Um, oh, the other thing was the focus exercise, which um, also, if I if you forget how to do the focus, make sure you let me know. Now, the focus is something I want, let's go through a little bit of the, uh, my prescription. I want everybody in the family doing the focus exercise with about 10 to 12 treats with each dog once a day. We'd also like to do the out for, the, for a week. And we like and each well actually for the focus up to ten days. And remember at first it's one second, one second, then eventually it's gonna be one second, twenty seconds. And make sure the dog is looking at your face and the treat the whole time. And go very gradually. If you start going one second, you go to four seconds, and at three seconds he's turning away. Then back up and go practice it three seconds or more. <coughs> eventually you want to get to the point where you're twenty seconds in the house, uh, even with the TV or the dogs barking and the dog stops just doing focuses with you. <laughs> the next step is when it's not as cold as it is outside is to go outside and do it outside but go back to one and practice it one second then two seconds and work your way back up to 20 seconds. The next step is to practice when you're actually on walks without any dogs, without any people around, easiest scenario possible. This time, however, when you say focus, the dog's going to look up at you as you're walking. You're going to hold up the treat to your nose and then start going towards the dog's mouth as you continue walking. So we're going to be able to redirect the dog's attention to us while we're walking and so it's almost running into stuff because it's looking up at us. Once you've gotten to that point, then if you're walking down the street and you see a dog across the street and it's Kevin, you say focus and Kevin looks up at you, you're starting to deliver the treat. He's practiced this behavior and so he's used to it taking 20 seconds. 20 seconds is usually long enough for you to pass the other dog. So he finally gets the treat in his mouth, he wants to chew it and yell at the other dog and oh, the other dog's walking away. So that way we create a positive, uh, not a positive association, but it's a powerful way to redirect the dog's attention. Now, if Kevin continues being reactive, we have a, a reactive dog class that we do in the spring where we actually do counter conditioning and teach him that when a dog approaches, it's actually a good thing. But Kevin was, grow uh, was nipping and biting at his guardians when they tried to correct him on the leash or just wouldn't let him go when he's going nuts. That's called redirected aggression. So we want to hit Kevin to remain sub-threshold, really all the dogs. So if we're out on a walk and he starts seeing something and starts getting worked up, stop. Ask him to sit, give him a focus exercise. If possible, redirect his, uh, you can't redirect his attention, move around a car or a bush or a house or something that blocks his view. If you can't do any of that, turn around and walk away, increase the distance. 
We want to find the distance where he can feel comfortable. And what we should notice is gradually the person can get a little bit, the other dog can get closer and closer without him being reactive. But this is also going to depend on the behavior of the other dog. If you have a dog that's walking in a nice, perfect heel next to the guardian, not barking, he's probably going to be able to get a lot closer to Kevin, where if it's a dog that's bouncing around and barking at everyone, Kevin's probably going to be reactive at a much greater distance. Now, Kevin is, uh, like I said, it seems to be an, an insecure dog in a lot of ways. The way he carries his body, the way he interacts, and he's reacting, and he's reacting out of an insecure place. I think he is so frustrated because he thinks he's doing a good job for uh, correcting his humans and trying to keep them safe, and the humans aren't listening to him. So he's just getting more and more stressed. We need to remove that burden of responsibility. The more that we enforce rules, the more we pet with a purpose, the more we do passive training, the more he's going to identify as a follower and then he won't think that it's his place to correct and nip and do all the rest of those things that he's doing. But while we're training him, in the meantime, if there's anything that he's excited about, like mealtime, we're going to mealtime, he went after, tried to go after both dogs. So if that's the case, and we might want to tether him like we did here so he's further away, he will, she understands how to stay away from him. Now, if he's also being bossy, if, I'm, if she's on the floor and, and we're petting her and he comes and shoves himself between us, He's trying to block us from him. You cannot allow that to happen. You need to make him move away, let her know, I've got your back, I'm gonna take care of you. Same sort of thing if she has a bone or a toy and one of the dogs starts approaching her, we need to correct them. Now if she's sensitive, I would be careful about hissing at her, hissing in that capacity because I think she would think it's her. So I might use the second or the third consequence, stand up, march over, don't let the dog get to her and get it, put your butt facing her, face the other dog and walk towards the dog, reverse herd that dog and make that dog move away the area. Uh, give her at least seven feet to be able to enjoy her bone or toy or whatever it is. But she needs to see that you guys are looking out for her. She's a good dog, she's a sensitive dog, uh, and she's not confrontational, which is great, but we don't want her to eventually snap because nobody's looking out for her, and the guardians have been advised that it's best to let the dogs work things out on their own. That is advice that's okay in some capacities. Never okay if it turns to an aggressive situation. Um, let me see, I'd like the guardians to not walk around the dogs, to walk through the dogs. So if the dog is there, you walk through them. Now if they're laying on the floor asleep, that's different, we can walk around them. But if they're standing in your way, don't slow down, just walk through them like they're invisible. The dogs need to learn when a human's coming, my job is to get out of the way. Um, let me see, I'm trying to think if there's something else. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, for feeding ritual, uh, they were feeding first, well they are feeding at the same time. But she has the best demeanor, so, and she's the oldest dog, so she should eat first. I would feed him second because he's got the best demeanor, and he has the most issues, and he's the one who's confrontational. So we want to put him on the lowest authority rung by not letting him, uh, by making him eat last. Now, also when they go and eat after they've eaten, if they leave food in their bowl, pick up the bowl, dump it, but put the empty bowl back down. I want no when the dog and put the place the bowls down in a situation so the dog, she, he's not walking by an empty uh, bowl with some food in it. That's too tempting for him. Uh, come up with a command word for each dog. Remember, when they take the first bite of food, say grub, chow, feast, or whatever the words are that you want to use. Um, remember, anytime you're giving a treat, the treat should go in the mouth first. The dog should hear the command word after that. Um, <clears throat> oh, the chocolate thing for the kids. So create a chart, and then every time the kids uh, pet with a purpose or reward desired action. So right there, you could have petted, petted and say, come. But she, but she did. She asked the dog to sit before she petted it. That's awesome. Uh, but every time the kid pets with a purpose or does something desirable, makes the dog sit at the door, enforces a rule, whatever, we take an M&M &M, we go put it in that kid's jar, and then at the end of the day, the kids count up the M&Ms. Whoever the most had, had the most M&Ms maybe gets to sleep with one of the dogs or doesn't have to do the dishes. Or you know, if one of the kids is so old that the chocolate isn't really that valuable, maybe they have to get a certain number of pieces of chocolate in order to spend the night at a friend's or do something along those lines. So you're creating a bit of a carrot situation and the child is motivated. Uh, that will help the dogs have more respect for the children as well, the more that they interact with them on those positive ways. And something else you might want to do is, he knows, uh, uh, Kevin knows a bunch of tricks, uh, but a lot of times when I have an insecure dog, what I want to do is teach them tricks and commands. Um, so, and that's a great way uh, to get the kids involved. Maybe mom or dad takes one of the kids and we, we would teach them to bounce a treat on their nose. Do it every Sunday, and then maybe you take one of the girls and you teach on Sunday, and then you teach the next girl the next Sunday, and then you teach the the first girl, uh, so we're switching parents and partners, but, and then all week long that week, we practice that one trick or exercise with, the, with uh, the dogs. And so that way the dogs know how to do that one and then we build up their self-esteem. Now again, it's gonna be, we always think it's faster to treat them all at the same time, put them in their kennels, or put one dog at a time. It's just, it's just gonna be much faster. 
Um, let me see. Uh, another rule, uh, they're not allowed to go in the kitchen when people are uh, preparing food. So, um, and again, if you need to, put down painter's tape or scotch tape, or well, not scotch tape, but masking tape or something, so you can see where that line is. And also, don't be afraid to put cardboard or like the, the doorway, the front door has multiple access points. So I laid some chairs on their side when we might want to put a piece of cardboard or something like that. And each time we do it, we move the door a little bit, make the opening a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger until it eventually is the full deal opening. Remember for the door, when we're coming home, we call or text whoever's home so we can practice this. And again, practice with the dogs separately, especially with Kevin. Um, so basically we put two dogs away and uh, we get the text and then we sit down, we act like we're just doing something casual. When somebody comes to answer the door, we're able to move that dog away from the door claim the area around the door, demonstrate to the dog that the humans have the situation under control, and the more the dogs see you doing that, the more the dogs see you not letting them in the, go sweat their buddy by standing behind the dog that's eating so I can try to take his food. The more you take those sort of things away, the more you reward desired actions and behaviors, the more those dogs are gonna be, these dogs are gonna be behaving better. Uh, now, because of Kevin's dust-ups and the issues, I suggest the guardians look into exercise. So she likes to play fetch, but she doesn't get to play with her toys very often because the other dogs steal them. But if she likes to play fetch, we can take her out and play fetch, or you can sometimes use a laser. If it's dark out early, some dog, a lot of dogs will chase a laser. Upping a dog's exercise is not going to fix your dog behavior problems, but it's going to make fixing your dog behavior problems much easier to do so. Um, now, these guys are kenneled for a lot longer than I would like them to be kenneled because the parent, both parents work. I'd like to see if they can engage a dog walker and come by about after four hours. Four hours is the maximum a dog should be in the kennel at any one stretch. Or look at taking them in a dog, doggy daycare. Now, Kevin has uh, come from a breeder and he went back. This guy came and Kevin came back into the house. Um, I told the guardians to start a journal and put down the exercise as well as any other notable achievements at the end of each day, give each dog a grade. So for her, we're looking at how confident she feels and how is, you know, we don't want her removing herself from the room. Um, we want, he's a puppy. We hopefully will get him in our puppy socialization class. We can work on some stuff with him. But he, give each dog a grade and play around with the exercise that you give the dogs in the morning or throughout the day. It should be throughout the day. Um, and eventually you'll find the right combination where you're like, man, all three dogs got an A minus. That was easy. For, that was a great day. Well, then now we have the roadmap to success. We know exactly how much exercise we need to get the dogs in order for them to achieve at peak efficiency. Uh, and don't let them climb across you like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the more that we come, once we identify where that is, then we can actually provide the dogs what they need. We take off that hard edge of too much excess energy, the anxiety and the frustration, and then they're easy to work with and it's easier for them to behave the way that we want them to behave. Right? Is that right, Kevin? Yes. Those are, the years are gradually coming up. The more mm -hmm. we enforce rules and structure, the more the dogs are gonna see us as an authority figure, the less pressure we take off or remove from their shoulders and the more that they can just go back to being a dog. But she's gonna be your biggest indicator. If she, at the end of 30 days, we'd like to kind of grade and keep that journal for at least 30 days, so at the end of that 30 day period, we can look and say, well, we haven't made a lot of progress with Kevin, then we have to ask ourselves a tough decision. Is this the best environment for Kevin? Maybe he could be in another environment where he would really thrive, but if he is making her feel uncomfortable and he's picking up on bad behaviors and he's biting the guardians and nipping the kids, this might not be the best situation. A lot of people, I see people put things off, put things off, hoping they're gonna get better. Dogs get better at anything that they do. So if he gets better and better at being aggressive, and then eventually we rehome him, now we're kicking our problem down the curb to somebody else where it might've been a, a non-starter non or a very easy problem to handle. Now, if you have questions or problems, I want you to call me or text me. Do not wait. The sooner you call me or text me, typically the easier the solution is. Now, um, we did not get through as much in this session as I would like to, so we might need to set up a follow-up session. We'll find out and see how it goes. I'd like to give it about 30 days and see how the family feels and have that journal so we can give an impartial grade and look and see, are we moving in the right direction? Or if we're just going up and down, up and down, or we're staying plateaued at the same direction, we might need to make some course corrections, some adjustments, or like I said, we might need to decide, is this the best environment for Kevin? Uh, and there's nothing wrong with giving a dog up if you can put it in a good environment. The breeders have been willing to take him back and the breeder's gonna find him a really good home. We hope that's not the case. But there's only so many hours in the day and we have to do what's best for the dogs and best for the family. All right, Mickey, did you have fun? I know you didn't have a lot of fun, but well, hopefully this is gonna make your life a lot more enjoyable and you can relax a lot more. All right, well, that's Kevin. You can't see him. This is Mickey and this is Penny and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you need it. All right, you stop it.